Welcome to Washington Today on C-SPAN Radio for Thursday, September 5th, 2024. Former President Donald Trump, the Republican presidential nominee, speaks at the Economic Club of New York about his economic policy proposals, including a new government efficiency commission to eliminate wasteful federal spending, which would be led by Tesla CEO Elon Musk. Also increasing energy production, cutting regulations, and slashing corporate taxes for companies that make products in the U.S. The judge in the Donald Trump federal election interference case holds a hearing on the revised indictment that takes into account the Supreme Court's ruling on presidential immunity. We'll talk about it with USA Today's Justice Department reporter, Bart Jansen. President Joe Biden visits the small agricultural town of Westby, Wisconsin, to announce over $7 billion for clean rural energy projects across the country. The 14-year-old suspect in yesterday's school shooting in Georgia is charged with four counts of murder. Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu says reports that negotiators are close to a ceasefire deal with Hamas are exactly inaccurate. And the Biden administration says Nicaragua has agreed to release 135 political prisoners, including members of a Christian evangelical group. From Associated Press, former President Donald Trump told a group of executives and industry leaders on Thursday he wants to lead a national economic renaissance by slashing regulations to boost energy production, embracing cryptocurrencies and drastically cutting government spending, as well as corporate taxes for companies that produce in the U.S. The GOP presidential nominee, speaking to the Economic Club of New York, said he would immediately issue a national emergency declaration to achieve a massive increase in the domestic energy supply and eliminate 10 current regulations for every new regulation that the government adopts. He said Tesla and SpaceX CEO Elon Musk has agreed to head a commission to perform a financial audit of the federal government that would save trillions of dollars. That was from Associated Press. Here is Donald Trump on the Government Efficiency Commission proposal. Fourth, at the suggestion of... Elon Musk, who has given me his complete and total endorsement. That's nice. Smart guy. He knows what he's doing. He knows what he's doing. It's very, very much appreciated. I will create a government efficiency commission task with conducting a complete financial and performance audit of the entire federal government and making recommendations for drastic reforms. We need to do it. Can't go on the way we are now. And Elon, because he's not very busy, has agreed to head that task force. Be interesting. If he has the time, that would be a good one to do it. But he's agreed to do it. In 2022, fraud and improper payments alone cost taxpayers an estimated hundreds of billions of dollars. As the first order of business, this commission will develop an action plan to totally eliminate fraud and improper payments within six months. This will save trillions of dollars, trillions. It's massive. Donald Trump, former president and Republican presidential nominee at Economic Club of New York. Elon Musk, the owner of Tesla, SpaceX, and the social media platform X, posted on X about heading that government efficiency commission. I look forward to serving America if the opportunity arises. No pay, no title, no recognition is needed. Here is more from Donald Trump's speech today talking about taxes. The fifth pillar of my plan is to make the Trump tax cuts permanent. They are massive tax cuts, biggest ever, permanent. And to cut taxes even more, and we will have no tax on tips, something which they copied four weeks after I said it. She got up and said, no tax on tips. I said, I just said that. She is actually copying a lot of my plan. In fact, we're going to send her a MAGA cap sometime in the next week. We're having a special one day. But we also know she doesn't mean it. She's going to stick with what her whole life has been about. And also, no tax on Social Security benefits. People in Social Security have been wiped out by inflation, and now on top of it, we tax their benefits. We're not going to tax their benefits. We have so many different ways of making so much money. This country, the potential is is so incredible. We don't have to take it away from people on Social Security. We're not going to do that. We're going to save Social Security. She's going to destroy Social Security. Under the Trump administration, we proved that targeted tax cuts do not increase the deficit. They reduce the deficit by growing the economy and raising revenue. After we gave the massive tax cuts, 
we took in the following year with a much lower rate, billions and billions of dollars more than we did the previous year with a high rate. Think of that. So with a much lower rate, we took in more money because people were incentivized. Corporate tax revenues are 31 percent higher today than before my tax law was signed. With all of those cuts, 31 percent higher. To further support the revival of American manufacturing, my plan calls for expanded R&D tax credits, 100 percent bonus depreciation, expensing for new manufacturing investments, and a reduction in the corporate tax rate from 21 percent to 15 percent solely for companies that make their product in America. You have to make your product in America. If you outsource, offshore, or replace American workers, you are not eligible for any of these benefits. In fact, you will pay a very substantial tariff when a product comes in from another country that's made in another country and comes in. There will be a big tariff on that product because we want to make our, our goods in America, and most of them we can. My message is simple. Make your product here in America, and only in America. We are not going to be taken advantage of anymore, just as we made great inroads and progress four years ago. We made tremendous inroads on this subject. Donald Trump, former president and Republican presidential nominee, part of his speech today at the Economic Club of New York. More from the Associated Press article, Donald Trump and Kamala Harris, the Democratic presidential nominee, want to take the corporate tax rate in opposite directions while arguing that each is better than the other for American business. It's one of the many ways the two major party nominees have laid out sharply different views on the economy, a critical issue in this year's election. Harris calls for raising the corporate tax rate to 28 percent from 21 percent. Her policy proposals this week have been geared toward promoting more entrepreneurship, a bet that making it easier to start new companies will increase middle class prosperity. That was from Associated Press. Vice President Harris spoke about the corporate tax rate Wednesday in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. And while we ensure that the wealthy and big corporations pay their fair share, we will tax capital gains at a rate that rewards investment in America's innovators, founders, and small businesses. So here's the detail. If you earn a million dollars a year or more, the tax rate on your long-term capital gains will be 28% under my plan because we know when the government encourages investment, it leads to broad-based economic growth and it creates jobs which makes our economy stronger. Vice President Kamala Harris, Democratic presidential nominee, Wednesday in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. CNBC notes that the proposed 28 percent tax on long-term capital gains for any household with an annual income of $1 million or more is lower than the 39.6 percent rate that President Joe Biden laid out in his 2025 fiscal year budget. Pittsburgh Post-Gazette notes that Vice President Kamala Harris will spend the next few days in Pittsburgh to prepare for Tuesday's debate against former President Donald Trump. Ms. Harris is scheduled to arrive on Thursday. She will stay in town for several days to get ready for her first confrontation with Trump, according to a source familiar with her plans. Speaking on condition of anonymity, the Washington Post, which first reported on Ms. Harris' schedule, said she also was expected to take breaks to meet voters in the area. That was from the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. The Democratic vice presidential nominee, Governor Tim Walz of Minnesota, has also been in Pennsylvania the past few days. He holds a rally tonight in Erie. On Wednesday, he was in Lancaster visiting a campaign office to speak with volunteers and make some calls to voters. Before I first and foremost to say thank you, uh, the energy that you're feeling in this room is across the country, whether it's in Omaha, Nebraska, or it was in Savannah, Georgia last week, or it's folks standing in 109 degree heat in Las Vegas here a couple of weeks ago, all with the beautiful idea that you come together here because you believe and you love this country. And the idea that politics can be joyful, and politics can be forward-looking, and politics can be decent and inspiring. Uh, all of those things uh, are possibilities for us. And what we know, too, about politics is it's a means to an end. 
not just about winning an election. We need to win the election so we can put policies in place that improve people's lives, whether that's access to reproductive care and health care, whether it's good public schools, where it's building infrastructure, or creating jobs that pay people a living wage so they can live their lives with dignity. And maybe the idea of owning a home someday shouldn't be so out of reach to people. And the policies that Vice President Harris is putting in place makes that possible. So we oftentimes say this, you don't get elected to bank political capital, you get elected to burn it to improve lives. And yes! Yeah. Look, this is going to be door to door, phone call to phone call. It's going to be engaging people who, it is a deliberate effort by some people to make them believe that our political system is broken, to make them believe that things are pessimistic. My God, every time I hear Donald Trump give a speech, it's like the next uh, screen play for Mad Max or something. <laughs> It's, it, they're rooting against America. They do not believe in the exceptionalists of this country. They do not believe in the people who built this country. They simply want to complain about them. And by you coming here and talking neighbor to neighbor, that's what inspires people. My wife always talks about this. She said, I don't read the paper to see the movie reviews. I ask people that I know what they think about it. And they tell them, that's the same thing that's going on here. And I think all of you in this room, it's not hyperbole to say, this election could very well hinge on this county here and this field office here and the folks that we get out. That is an awesome responsibility, but it's also an awesome opportunity. Minnesota Governor Tim Walz, the Democratic vice presidential nominee, visiting a Harris Walz campaign office in Lancaster, Pennsylvania on Wednesday. The story in the Pennsylvania Capital Star notes that according to the 2020 U.S. Census, Lancaster County has the sixth largest population of the state's 67 counties. Donald Trump won Lancaster in both 2016 and 2020, the largest Pennsylvania county where he did so. During Trump's first successful bid for the White House, he won Lancaster County by 20 points over Hillary Clinton and beat Joe Biden there in 2020 by 16 points. Lancaster County has traditionally been safely conservative, but Democrats see an opportunity to make gains in the 2024 election there. Governor Josh Shapiro and U.S. Senator John Fetterman both reduced Republicans' margins of victory in the county for the 2022 election, and statewide judicial candidates continue to close the margins in 2023. That from the Pennsylvania Capitol Star. The Republican vice presidential nominee, Senator J.D. Vance of Ohio, campaigns tonight in Phoenix, Arizona. On Wednesday, he was in Mesa, Arizona, with political activist Charlie Kirk. The event was hosted by Turning Point Action and held at Generation Church. Here's part of that. Tim Walls signed a piece of legislation. And what, by the way, Washington, Oregon, and California have very similar laws. And these are called trans sanctuary state laws, where effectively it is medical kidnapping, where if you have a 14-year-old son or daughter that declares that they are a boy when they are biologically a girl, or vice versa, that the state has the ability to take possession and custody of your minor if you as the parent right. do not affirm the new gender that they might have learned at school or on TikTok. Is that correct, J.D.? That's exactly right. And that's kidnapping, Charlie. That is that legalized is kidnapping. kidnapping. And if you're a Christian or just a person of conscience in this country, you ought to be telling the person who wants to do that, no way. We are not letting you anywhere near the halls of power. And that's what we have an opportunity to do. But it, it's, man, it is so sick. I mean, think about this. Look. Charlie, I have an incredible amount of sympathy and compassion for some of these kids. I mean, you know, adolescence is confusing for almost every teenager, right? Every teenager goes through this or that thing. They, they, they go through an awkward phase. They maybe go through a goth phase. That was big when I was a kid in the 90s. Look, every, you know, kids go through this stuff. But now we have social media going and telling them that, hey, you know, it's not just growing up or it's not just growing pains. You are in the wrong body and you need to go mutilate yourself to feel like a whole person again, that's a terribly scary thing for a young teenager to go through. Tim Waltz wants to take those kids away from their parents. I think we ought to encourage the parents to make those kids safe and to help them deal with whatever they're dealing with, not steal them away from the people who love them the most. It's sick, but it's... It's, it's not just sick, Charlie, it reveals an entire value set. You ask yourself, how could you be the governor 
of a state. I mean, every protective instinct that I have as a father is if I'm in a position of leadership, I'm going to fight back against the people who are trying to burn down my city. Or I've got three little kids. I'm going to fight back against the people who are trying to take my children away from me because they, they, they got a weird idea in their head from social media. Or I'm going to fight back against the people who are stealing the jobs of American workers or making it unaffordable for young Americans to buy a home. Tim Waltz, every single time he gets an opportunity, He fights for the people who are harming American citizens. We need a president who's going to fight for American citizens. We just don't have that right now in this country. Amen. Republican vice presidential nominee, Senator J.D. Vance of Ohio, with Charlie Kirk, founder and president of Turning Point USA, on Wednesday in Mesa, Arizona. A New York Times fact check article on the answer you just heard writes, this is false. Since Mr. Waltz was picked as Vice President Kamala Harris's running mate, conservative groups, including the Alliance Defending Freedom, the Conservative Christian Legal Advocacy Group, have claimed that the Minnesota state authorities can terminate the parental rights of parents who prevent their children from receiving gender-affirming care. Spokeswoman for Mr. Vance cited the Alliance's arguments to support his claim. But those groups have been unable to name a case in which that has happened, pointing instead to hypothetical scenarios about a provision in the law that grants Minnesota courts temporary emergency jurisdiction during custody disputes crossing state lines if a child has been unable to obtain gender affirming health care. That was from a New York Times fact check article. This is Washington Today. Washington Post has an update on yesterday's Georgia school shooting. A 14-year-old student at Appalachia High School in Winder, Georgia, has been charged with four felony counts of murder after he allegedly opened fire at the school Wednesday, according to the Georgia Bureau of Investigation. The shooting left four people dead and injured nine others who are expected to survive, Barrow County officials said. Investigators are looking into the possible motives of the suspect, who was booked into a youth detention center in Gainesville overnight and is expected to make a virtual court appearance Friday morning, authorities said. It was from the Washington Post. President Joe Biden made his first public comments about this school shooting at the start of his event in Westby, Wisconsin. Before I begin, with your permission, I'd like to say a few words about the school shooting yesterday in Winder County, Georgia. You know, uh, my wife Jill and I are mourning those four gunned down two, two students and two teachers wounded and hospitalized nine others, I'm sure you are as well. You know, uh, students, just young teenagers, educators, just doing their jobs, a community like so many around the country, just getting back to school, and a joyous and exciting time, absolutely shattered, shattered. I directed my team to immediately ensure that we're doing everything we can to provide support. The Department of Justice and the FBI are working closely with the state and local law enforcement investigating this. We have a lot of information, not all of it. We're grateful the school personnel and first responders who proved and prevented more people from being killed or injured and brought the suspect to custody. But as a nation, we cannot continue to accept the carnage of gun violence. I'm a gun owner. I believe strongly in the amendment we need more thought, more than thoughts and prayers. Some of my Republican friends in Congress who just finally have to say enough is enough. We have to do something. Together, let's ban assault weapons. My dad is a hunter. I don't know a whole hell of a lot of deer wearing Kevlar vests. I'm serious about this. High capacity magazines, once again, what do we need them for in terms of domestic reuse? There are too many people who are able to access guns that shouldn't be able to. So let's require safe storage of firearms. I know I have mine locked up, but how could you have an assault rifle, a weapon in a house not locked up and knowing your kid knows where it is? You've got to hold parents accountable if they let their child have access to these guns. Let's enact universal background checks and then immunity, and then immunity for gun manufacturers. And I realize I'm in a rural area like the rural parts of my state where guns, we all have them. And it's not popular to talk about it, but the truth is there's a difference between rational and irrational. Imagine, you know, the only outfit in the world that we can't sue and by law, passed by law, are gun manufacturers. How about if that was the case of big tobacco? What do you think would happen? If we're not able to have sued tobacco, 
How many more people would be dead now, but, 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 for the, uh, but, but for the ability to change the law? President Joe Biden today in Westby, Wisconsin. Associated Press writes that classes were canceled Thursday at the Georgia High School, though some people came to leave flowers around the flagpole and kneel in the grass with heads bowed. Journal Times of Wisconsin, reporting on the president's visit, says that Air Force One landed in Westby, where President Biden will tour the Vernon Electric Cooperative before touting a $7.3 billion investment in clean and reliable electricity for rural America as part of his Investing in America agenda. Biden is set to announce the first 16 rural electric cooperatives receiving new ERA awards, which will serve rural communities in 23 states, including western Wisconsin. That was from the Journal Times in Wisconsin. Here is more from President Joe Biden's speech on this issue. Here in Westby, you know, I'm proud to announce that my, uh, my investments, that through my investments, the most significant climate change law ever, and by the way, it is a $369 billion bill. It's called the, uh, we, we should have named it what it was, but it, but at any rate, the Department of Agriculture is able from that legislation to announce $7.3 billion in grants to 16 electrical co-ops nationwide to help rural communities transition to clean, affordable, reliable energy. It's the most significant transformative investment in electricity and electrification and clean energy for rural America since FDR's New Deal nearly 90 years ago. And that's not hype, that's a fact. And it includes Dairyland Power Cooperative that will receive $580 million to develop and purchase solar power, wind power, energy stores right here in Wisconsin and all across the Midwest. And here's why it's a game changer. Before the New Deal, private companies refused to provide affordable electricity to rural communities. As a result, one in 10 rural households, only one in 10, had electricity before FDR came to power. So farmers had to organize electric co-ops to distribute electricity to their families and their communities. With help from the New Deal, there are now more than 800 rural electric co-ops to provide electricity for 40 million Americans in 48 states. But key challenges, they've over overcome them, but there's still the co-ops are still nonprofits. They don't have the same resources that private utility companies have to modernize their energy infrastructure. And for decades, they couldn't access tax credits and make clean energy more affordable. That's why Campbell and I ensured that the, for the first time in American history that these nonprofit co-ops can benefit from clean energy tax credits just like for-profit utilities have for decades. President Joe Biden in Westby, Wisconsin. From a Reuters article, the projects funded by the IRA's Empowering Rural America new ERA program will prevent more than 43 million tons of greenhouse gas pollution annually and support more than 4,500 permanent jobs and 16,000 construction jobs, the White House said. And rural electric cooperatives serve 42 million people, according to the National Rural Electric Cooperative Association. That reporting from Reuters. Wall Street today, the Dow down 219, NASDAQ up 43, S&P down 16. USA Today's justice correspondent Bart Jensen wrote this morning that U.S. District Judge Tanya Chutkin begins grappling Thursday with which federal charges for trying to steal the 2020 election former President Donald Trump must still face after the Supreme Court ruled he is shielded from charges for official acts as president. Joining us now is Bart Jensen, who is at today's hearing in the courtroom in Washington, D.C. Thanks for being with us. What happened? Oh, thanks for having me. Yeah, uh, they spent uh, less than two hours, but uh, debating basically how to move forward. Um, prosecutors are eager to start debating whether he is immune. They say they're ready to file a brief that would lay out their case. They'd have exhibits that describe all of the evidence, all sorts of uh, grand jury transcripts and FBI interview forms. That they're ready to file something like that within three weeks to describe the case and why they don't think Trump should be shielded from these charges. 
and then presumably the defense would have to respond. And there's the expectation that no matter which way this decision goes, even from Chutkin herself, that it will be appealed all the way to the Supreme Court again. But the defense lawyers, Trump's lawyers, uh, led by John Morrow, were very opposed to having that kind of a brief where there would be a lot of detailed accusations being made about Trump in the heart of the presidential campaign. And so they said it would be uh, hugely unfair and uh, very prejudicial and uh, create bias against them and their side of the case if the judge were to take that path. Um, She said that she would issue a schedule about what sorts of filings she wants and under what deadlines by the end of Thursday. Does that mean that the superseding indictment as filed by the special counsel where he said, here are the charges that we think fall under the Supreme Court decision and removing the ones that that uh, that wouldn't be allowed, that's still to be determined by this judge? Correct. Yeah, we're dealing with very fresh, very uncharted ter- territory. Um, you know, well, For example, a former president has never faced criminal charges before. The Supreme Court's decision saying basically he's protected from charges for anything that is unique to the presidency, that's pardons and vetoes sort of stuff, so that's not really in play. But that he's also presumptively immune for charges applying to his official duties, and that he can be charged, that he is open to charge, vulnerable to charge, if he has private actions, even as president. So the fight is over whether what he did was an official act or not. And that's what Chutkin has to rule on. Um, Trump's lawyers say everything that he was doing was an official act, that when he talked about his concerns about voter fraud, uh, which were dismissed by state level Republican officials in these key swing states and by his own attorney general, Bill Barr, there was nothing to them. There was no widespread fraud. They certified the election. Um, he, his challenges to those were fair play uh, and that uh, he that it was an official act. It was a concern of the president and so should not be charged with him. The prosecution, on the other hand, says that that sort of activity was private activity because it was electioneering, essentially. It was trying to remain in office rather than conduct the duties of the office. So he, he was a, they're viewing him as a candidate when he was doing those things rather than also as a sitting president. And so that's this very difficult task that Chutkin has to weigh which of these activities are official and which aren't. And a key point in that is deals with communications that Trump had with his vice president, Mike Pence. Those accusations are in the indictment. And basically, he was trying to pressure Pence to disregard electoral college votes from a half dozen of these key swing states. Pence declined. Now, Trump's lawyers say, that was official communication. He's, it's the president talking to his own vice president. How could that possibly be a private uh, action? And so because that stuff is in the indictment, the entire indictment is tainted. And so the whole thing is going to collapse. Uh, in Moro's phrase, it's going to crater. <laughs> so prosecutors, though, say that Pence was serving in his role as president of the Senate, when they were counting electoral college votes and that his declining to participate in the conspiracy was more of a legislative act. And again, it was Trump basically asking for campaign help rather than official help. And so that will be one of the key uh, issues that Chutkin has to decide. And the Supreme Court itself has said that that's going to be a very difficult uh, decision to make. This all sounds like this case is not going to head to trial before the election. There's no way. It doesn't appear that there is any way that we get a trial before the election, um, even if we were to get debate on immunity before the election, which Chutkin seemed inclined to grant. um, It's not clear how much information we're going to get before the election at all. If, if, if the prosecution has three weeks to file, the defense would have 
probably another three weeks, and then they have to set a hearing to uh, allow the two sides to debate in person. And all of that, uh, legal experts have told me, would take a couple of months. And so um, it's very unlikely, even for the immunity debate, to play out before the election. Now, that timing, though, is was one of the uh, hot spots of the debate in court because prosecutors are offering to submit this massive new brief that details the accusations in a much more comprehensive way. And it, there'd be a lot of new information and there'd be grand jury transcripts and FBI interview forms. And so there'd be a lot more color to the accusations that would become a lot more vivid. And Trump's lawyers are very concerned about basically the unanswered accusations being thrown out at the end of September when he's still campaigning for president for a little more than a month after that. Um, they would get a chance to reply in on paper, uh, you know, a few weeks later, but they are concerned that the damage would already be done. Um, Chupkin, though, responded, hey, she doesn't care about the election calendar. What she's doing is presiding over a case of four charges against a private citizen, and she doesn't care that he is a candidate for president. She says she's trying to run the trial fairly. So she didn't tip her hand which way she's going to decide, but she wants to get the case moving. She says the charges were filed more than a year ago, and she wants to get things going um, she says they're, they're in no danger of sprinting to the finish line at this point. Bart Jansen, USA Today's Justice Department correspondent, joining us. You can find his stories at usatoday.com. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And an update late afternoon from Politico's Kyle Cheney. Judge Chutkin sets a schedule for Jack Smith and Donald Trump to make immunity-related filings. Smith on September 26th, Donald Trump on October 17th, and then Smith replying on October 29th. ABC News has a story after hours of legal wrangling on Thursday. Hunter Biden pleaded guilty to nine tax-related charges in a last-minute bid to avoid a lengthy and potentially embarrassing trial, abandoning an earlier proposal to plead guilty while maintaining his innocence on the underlying conduct. U.S. Judge Mark Scarzi accepted Hunter Biden's guilty plea to his nine-count tax case. Sentencing in the case is scheduled for December 16th. Scarcey clarified that Hunter Biden faces a maximum sentence of 17 years in prison and a fine of as much as $1.35 million. Prosecutors accused Hunter Biden in December of engaging in a four-year scheme to avoid paying $1.4 million in taxes while spending hundreds of thousands of dollars on exotic cars, clothing, escorts, drugs, and luxury hotels. That was the article from ABC News. Hunter Biden's attorney, Abby Lowell, spoke to reporters outside the courthouse in Los Angeles. Hunter decided to enter his plea to protect those he loves from unnecessary hurt and cruel humiliation. This plea prevents that kind of show trial that would have not provided all the facts or served any real point in justice. He will now move on to the sentencing phase while keeping open the options to raise the many clear issues with this case on appeal. There's no doubt this case was an extreme and unusual one for the government to bring. Like millions of Americans, Hunter was late in filing and paying his taxes. Unlike those millions of Americans, he was charged criminally for his failures that occurred during the depths of his addiction to drugs and alcohol. Abby Lowell, attorney for Hunter Biden outside the courthouse in Los Angeles. The White House press secretary, Karine Jean-Pierre, was asked earlier in the day during a news conference on Air Force One what the president thought of Hunter Biden changing his plea. On uh, Hunter Biden changing his uh, plea, does the White House have a comment at all, and does that change the president's calculus on pardoning his son? So on your first question, uh, I, I'm not able to, com- to comment at this time. On your second question, which was, I guess, part of one question, uh, it's no. It's still no. Was the president aware that he was going to plead uh, guilty? I, 
I don't have anything else. I'm not able to comment on it, but I can say that uh, it, it is still very much a no to the questions that I've gotten about if the president's going to pardon his son, you, but I don't have anything else to add. Can you comment on whether a commutation would be on or off the table? That's also no. Did the decision to change his, his plea have anything to do with the president no longer running for re-election? I don't have anything to, to say beyond what I just said. White House Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre answering reporters' questions on Air Force One. Washington Today continues in a moment. The House will be in order. This year, C-SPAN celebrates 45 years of covering Congress like no other. Since 1979, we've been your primary source for Capitol Hill, providing balanced, unfiltered coverage of government, taking you to where the policies debated and decided, all with the support of America's cable companies. C-SPAN, 45 years and counting, powered by cable. Welcome back to Washington Today, available as a podcast on the free C-SPAN Now mobile app and wherever you find your podcasts. Senior Hamas leader Khalil Al-Haya, writes Associated Press, accused Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu Thursday of deliberately stalling ceasefire negotiations and urged the U.S. and the international community to put more pressure on Israel. In a recorded speech released on Hamas's official account, Al Haya, who has been heading the militant group's delegation to the ceasefire talks, reiterated the group's stance that it will not consider any proposed deal that does not entail a full withdrawal of Israeli forces from the Gaza Strip, and particularly from the Philadelphia Corridor, a key area along Gaza's border with Egypt. That was from AP. Prime Minister Netanyahu was interviewed this morning on Fox News. Jerusalem Post is reporting that you're 90 percent there in negotiations with Hamas towards a ceasefire deal. Would you say that's accurate? No, it's exactly inaccurate. Uh, there's a story, a narrative out there that there's a deal out there. In fact, while we agreed uh, in uh, July and in, in May and July and in August to uh, uh, a deal and to an American proposal, Hamas has consistently said no to every one of them. They don't agree to anything, not to the Philadelphia corridor, not to the uh, uh, keys of exchanging uh, hostages for jail terrorists, not to anything. So that's just a false narrative. They just want us out of Gaza so they can retake Gaza and do as they vow to do uh, the November 7th massacre, again, the butchery, again and again and again. And you saw how horrible this butchery is the other day when they murdered in cold blood six of our hostages. Uh, so to ask Israel to make concessions after this murder is to is to send a message to Hamas, murder more hostages, you'll get more concessions. That's the wrong thing to do. And I think the Israeli public overwhelmingly is united against that. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu interviewed on Fox News this morning. The White House National Security Communications Advisor John Kirby was asked about that during a virtual audio news conference. We just heard uh, an interview with Netanyahu this morning on another network, and he said very clearly, there is not a deal in the more making. Unfortunately, it's not close. He was asked about your colleague's uh, estimation yesterday that the deal is 90% done. He said it's exactly inaccurate. The president on Sunday said that we're on the verge of an agreement. Um, that was after the bodies had been found. So what do you make of the prime minister's rejection, not just of your characterization of the deal being 90 percent done, but saying point blank, there is not a deal in the making. Yeah, I think, um, first of all, my colleague that you're referring to also was was very clear that while much of the text has been agreed to, the exchange of prisoners has not been agreed to. And that really comes, that's the heart of this deal, is the exchange. Um, and it's not been agreed to. As we talked about before, it's the implementation of the of the framework. The framework itself has been agreed to. Um, and of course, Hamas executed hostages over the weekend. Um, uh, and, uh, and also, in fact, changed some of the terms of the exchange. So... As I said earlier, while that execution absolutely, uh, certainly dramatically, and I shouldn't say dramatically, certainly changed 
um, the pool of hostages that could be available um, and absolutely created a sense of even greater urgency to get the deal. Um, uh, it also it, it also underscores how difficult it is to negotiate with a guy like Mr. Sinmar. Um, and I think I want to come back to what I've said before. Uh, when we talk about obstacles to the deal here, it's Mr. Sinmar. But my colleague was not uh, overly rosy or optimistic. Uh, we still believe that it can be done. We're not Pollyannish about the difficulty in getting there. White House National Security Communications Advisor John Kirby during an audio news conference today. Times of Israel has a story. The father of a U.S. Israeli held hostage in Gaza said Thursday there is no truth to report that the families of captives with American citizenship are petitioning the Biden administration to cut a unilateral deal with Hamas to free their loved ones. Jonathan Dekel Chen, whose son was kidnapped from near Oz on October 7, told Channel 12 that the report carried by NBC News on Wednesday is false. He said, I am in continuous contact with the other American families and all levels of the U.S. government. The report that the American families are demanding a separate U.S. Hamas deal is not correct. John Kirby also spoke about developments out of Nicaragua. Reuters reports the U.S. has secured the release of 135 political prisoners in Nicaragua on humanitarian grounds, adding that they will go to Guatemala before seeking to lawfully move to the United States or other nations. This release follows months of negotiations between the U.S. and Nicaragua, the U.S. and Guatemala said in a joint statement. Here again is the White House National Security Spokesperson, John Kirby. In partnership with uh, uh, with uh, with partners in the in the Western Hemisphere, uh, early this morning, the United States government secured the release of 135 Nicaraguan political prisoners, including Catholic lay people, human rights defenders, students, and others who the government of Nicaragua consider a threat to their authoritarian rule. In coordination with President Arevalo of Guatemala and his democratically elected government, the United States helped facilitate the transport of all 135 Nicaraguans to Guatemala. And they should be arriving there as we speak. Through our partners in Guatemala, we will help provide them with medical and trauma care, place to stay, clothing and hygiene kits, along with other immediate support. And I think it's important that we don't forget, these are people who have been unjustly detained for months, some of them for years, without access to basic needs. Thanks to President Biden's Safe Mobility Office Initiative, one of which is located in Guatemala, these Nicaraguan citizens will be able to seek lawful pathways to migrate to a new country and they'll uh, and to, uh, to rebuild their lives. So it's a real tangible example of what democracies can do working together to, to, to help people. White House National Security Spokesperson John Kirby in an audio news conference. And now to Russia's war with Ukraine. From Deutsche Welle, Russian President Vladimir Putin said that his government was ready for peace talks with Ukraine after having previously said that the Ukrainian incursion in Kurtz made negotiations impossible. He said that a deal that was outlined during earlier peace talks in Istanbul but never implemented could serve as the basis for a new truce. Putin suggested that fellow BRICS members, China, Brazil, and India, could act as mediators. Russia chairs this group of emerging economies, which also includes South Africa. Vladimir Putin spoke at a forum in Vladivostok. The Pentagon Deputy Press Secretary Sabrina Singh was asked at a news conference today about U.S. policy in this war. Questions sure. on uh, Ukraine and South Korea. Okay. Uh, Ukraine President Zelensky said that uh, if the United States authorized the use of long-range missiles, Ukraine could easily defeat Russia. So why is the United States reluctant to allow Ukraine to use long-range weapons? So thanks, Janie, for the question. Um, our intelligence assesses that um, 90 percent of Russian aircraft launching the glide bombs and the firing missiles against Ukraine um, are at airfields that are 300 kilometers away from Ukrainian controlled territory. Um, so these airfields now puts that out of a range. 
Um, so attackums would not be able to reach these airfields. So therefore, the challenges posed by these glide bombs, um, you know, would still remain. Um, and even if Ukraine, you know, were to use attackums against the very small percentage that of the airfields that remain in range. We've seen Russian the the Russian military move those airfields back. So again, uh, the impact would be very little and a very little strategic value. And you had another question. Yeah, thank mm -hmm. you. And does the United States still want South Korea to provide additional weapons, including 155 millimeter artillery set? I think we've been very clear with uh, all partners and allies all around the world willing and able to provide military assistance to Ukraine, including 155 millimeter rounds that we know they desperately need um, to, to help uh, Ukraine in their fight. Um, I won't speak for other nations and what they're providing, um, but as I mentioned at the top, uh, you know, there is a UDCG tomorrow. Um, air defense is one of the many topics that is going to come up at that UDCG. Uh, we know a priority for Ukraine is those 155mm rounds. So whatever other nations can provide uh, would certainly be welcome to Ukraine. Pentagon Deputy Press Secretary Sabrina Singh, UDCG, Ukraine Defense Consultative Group. An AFP reports that German Chancellor Olaf Scholz and Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky will meet on Friday in Frankfurt. The one-on-one -on -one talks will come as Ukraine's military backers, including the United States, gather at a U.S. air base in Germany to coordinate their support for Kyiv. The Billington Cybersecurity Summit is happening this week in Washington. The promotion from the company reads, join over 2,500 attendees and 200-plus top speakers participating in more than 40 sessions and breakouts at the 15th annual Billington Cybersecurity Summit, the leading government cybersecurity summit. One of the speakers today was General C.Q. Brown, chair of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, interviewed by Dave Levy, Amazon Web Services Worldwide Public Sector Vice President. One of the topics was the role of artificial intelligence, AI, in the future of warfare. While you were in the engineering and math building, I was probably in the rudimentary computer lab that we had at Texas Tech back then, and learning ancient languages like COBOL and Fortran. Yeah. But there's, there's new emerging technologies um, like generative artificial intelligence and artificial intelligence, and, and these things have gotten better. How do you see these new technologies impacting the warfighter and what you do? Well, I, I see great opportunity. I just, you know, uh, matter of fact, I was just someplace yesterday at a uh, conference where we spent quite a bit of time talking about artificial intelligence. There's, there's areas that I, I really, as I, as I think about where we need to head from a, uh, a DOD perspective and my own kind of thought process, there's three areas. There's a foundation, there's a data, and there's a focus. And the foundation piece is we've got to make sure we have the right infrastructure so we can actually run AI on our weapon systems or in our decision-making process. We have to have the right architecture as part of that foundation as well. Data, we got a lot of. But we've got to get the data in the right place that can run on the infrastructure with the architecture. And then we have to have focus. And that focus, we need to focus our effort because I don't know that we can just take AI and sprinkle it all over everything. Uh, we do very good about putting it on a PowerPoint slide to talk about it, yeah. but how do you make sure you're putting it in the right place in right effort? Making sure that you're hit, putting the right resources behind it, making sure you have the right talent, because we got to make sure we have talent in uniform that can actually talk to those outside um, yeah. that actually are building this capability. So we, we, we're not talking past each other, but we're bringing those things together. And then there's culture. Uh, because there'll be some people that really uh, are enamored with AI and want to use it, and others that will, will be afraid of it. The other part I do think about is uh, not only how we are able to use a, uh, artificial intelligence, how we're able to work with and collaborate with uh, the tech sector, but also what our adversaries might do. Because they may do, you know, they may have uh, do some things that we would not do based on our own values. We got to understand that and where the risks are associated with uh, artificial intelligence. So that's those are the things I think about as a as a yeah. focused on uh, bringing in artificial intelligence into uh, in, into our war fighting. General C.Q. Brown, chair of the Joint Chiefs of Staff at the Billington Cybersecurity Summit happening in Washington this week. An article from Defense Scoop back in May reads: The Pentagon wants public feedback that could help guide the development of policies, initiatives, and resource distribution to support the defense industrial base in integrating AI into the systems it produces. 
Responses will also inform a trusted AI defense industrial base roadmap that officials plan to create. Former First Lady Melania Trump is about to release a memoir and is titled Melania. Skyhorse Publishing describes the book as an intimate portrait of a woman who has lived an extraordinary life that will include stories and images never before shared with the public. Melania Trump posted a video today. Writing this memoir has been a deeply personal and reflective journey for me. As a private person who has often been the subject of public scrutiny and misrepresentation, I feel a responsibility to clarify the facts. I believe it is important to share my perspective, the truth. Former First Lady Melania Trump posting that video. Some of the images include her touring Africa and at events highlighting her Be Best initiative when she was in the White House. The book Melania goes on sale October 1st. Thanks for listening to Washington Today. Subscribe to C-SPAN's free evening newsletter, Word for Word. We'll send the stories making headlines in Washington to your inbox every day. Sign up at cspan.org slash connect. Have a good night.